Papa Day and welcome to Reporter's Journal. This is Lacey Martinez Francisco and I'm here with a long time Guam journalist, Arlene Santos Steffi. I'm very, very proud Aww. to be here because you are one of my, I mean, truly one of my mentors, one of the people that I look up to since I began my career as a journalist. Really? Yeah. And you know, not too long ago, Arlene, um, I did an interview with you for for another publication. Yes, yeah, you and did. And that was the, the, one of the first things I asked you. I remember was, "What do you want me to call you? Like, what is your, um, what what is what do you do for a living? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have more titles than I need. They're so distracting. It to me, it's not relevant. You can call me R. Right. That really makes me happy. But you know, on paper, right, I had to write something yes. down. And I, the, I think the first thing you wanted me to talk about was journalism. Mm-hmm. I consider myself first and foremost a journalist. And everything that has developed in my mass communication career has come from that. Um, so um, I have been a member of the Society of Professional Journalists. And I probably, one of the few on the island that uh, to this day pay my dues and receive uh, some of the support from them. I think a few of us here are also with SPJ. However, I didn't pay my dues this year, so I told them I couldn't. <laughs> Just running into some financial funds. But uh, today we are going to be talking about your your story, basically, mm-hmm. you know, your history here on Guam, and talking about some of the things that sh- exciting things that are going to be happening with you and with um, with us here too. You're going to be able to to contribute back to our uh, to KUM Communications. I'm super excited about that. Too. I'm home. I can't believe it. I said, Marie. Thank you for bringing me home. You know, um, when when Marie brought this idea up uh, to be a host of a podcast, I couldn't even pronounce it. I never heard what it was. It's like, what is that? I couldn't I couldn't get it right. I kept calling it something different, and uh, she and Christy kept correcting me. But it, it really didn't sink because I wasn't aware of what it was. But after, you know, in time, things settle in my brain and. Um, I feel like I've accomplished a lot as a columnist, 25 years of working as a columnist in Guam newspapers, all of them, by the way, <laughs> including even including uh, newspapers in Saipan. I've contributed to them as well. So I think it's time to move on, and I'm excited to go on this new venture. Right. So in the future, and we'll talk about that a little more as we go on with this mm-hmm. podcast, you, you are going to be having your own podcast, which is exciting because it's a longer format. Yes. And so let's talk about about you this is most definitely about you and it's going to be the primer to that to what's what's going to be happening with your show um and where do you get your backbone you know you are a hard (laughs) nosed journalist i have no fear i think is what that is i'm not afraid I'm not afraid to ask the question. My parents will tell you, if my father was alive, he, he, he took a lot of pride in my questioning things as a kid. My mother drained her, because <laughs> it's like, why was never sufficient, because was never enough. And it, it just, my brain just sucks everything up. I want to learn. And uh, as a course, a natural course of that is progression. You know, once, I, once I'm satisfied, with what I'm doing and feel that I've done the best I can and that I've contributed significantly, then I start looking around like, what else can I do? And that's how it happened. And, and you are, I mean, you study a lot of Chamorro history and you, you're an ethnographer. And, and how did your family life play into that? Your father was a was Chamorro, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember you telling me about that and how he wanted you to pursue what you needed to do or what you wanted. Like- My father, in, in you know, grow, when you grow up and, and you watch your parents, um, you don't put labels on them other than mom and dad. Mm-hmm. You don't look at th- where they get their perspectives from. You don't really sit down and, and discuss those kind of things. So I grew up in a family where my father was very open-minded. Um, I was uh, I was the eldest of three, or I am the eldest of three, the only girl, two boys after me. I grew up with cousins, mostly male. I didn't have any sister influences in my life. So I need to grow balls in order to be with the boys. I mean, they were not going to hand me any prissy opportunities. If you want to do what we're doing, if you want to ride the motorcycle, you're going to have to fall and scrape your knees. If you want to get underneath the hood of a car, then you got to get your hands greasy. And if you want to eat any of this chicken, you're going to have to pluck the feathers from it and go through that whole stinky process. But 
I just did what I had to do. I never really thought much about it. Um, I don't contemplate what I've got. It's opportunity, and I always want to be there. I want to be involved. I, and so every time they're going to do anything, I would push myself in. I go, yeah, I want to. And they go, get out of here. You're a girl. And I say, what does that have to do with anything? So it started there. And you weren't given those restrictions that people place. No. place on you that I mean even now there's a lot of like gender roles that people are given I didn't even know what that was except my cousins would say you're a girl and that stopped real quick because I was better at, the, at whatever they were doing I was faster I was really skinny I ran I was so competitive that the label dropped <laughs> So they stop being concerned about me being a girl. That's wonderful because I think a lot of, I mean, older families, I would assume that they were trying to impose, you know, a position for you where, where your place was. Well, actually, that's a different question. I did have a place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a very uncomfortable place for me because my father, my grandfather was murdered or shot uh, and died from shrapnel in World War Two, just at the tail end of the war. Uh, at Pago Bay. And he and my father's sister, Maria, were coming back from Agania, and she was a seamstress, so the Japanese used her to mend Japanese clothing, the soldiers' clothing, and my grandfather was a blacksmith. And Uncle Jack Luhan knew my grandfather. They actually apprenticed together. And so Uncle Jack Luhan is where I got stories about my grandfather being a blacksmith. And I never took the opportunity to forge a knife with Uncle Jack because I've just been so busy. And then Uncle Jack got older and he couldn't do it anymore. And I lost that opportunity. So those are the things that I regret is not having enough lifespan (laughs) and enough energy to do the things I want. But because of that experience with my grandfather, my father had to forfeit going to school and become a lawyer and uh, helped his mother. And so he married late. Uh, I think he was in his 30s when he married. My mother was 22. So they didn't get married out of high school, didn't even meet, except because of work. So my father was a revenue agent with RevTax, and my grandma, uh, my, my mother worked with Berdalio because she's a kotla. So she worked with the wholesale company or something, and he came to do the audit on the liquor. And that's when he saw my mom and asked her, asked her who she was, and she said, you know, I have these tickets for a dance at the Tamuning uh, Community Center. Would you, would you be willing to buy it? And she was just interested in selling the tickets. She was not interested in my father. And he said, I would buy a ticket on one condition that I get the first dance. And you know what her answer was? Well, if you're there on time. <laughs> he bought the ticket and he made sure he was there on time. So that's, those are my parents. My, my mom is very traditional. My father is not. He's, he believes in... I did not know... I, if I had to label him today, I would say that he was a feminist. He did not hold me bound to traditional tomorrow women's roles. He told me early on, you can do whatever you want. You have a brain. Use it. So I did. And that frustrated my brother... <laughs> Because it's like, wait a minute, you know, she's not supposed to be here, but we, I'm very competitive. So that's probably where a lot of my drive comes from. And, and what had, what path did that set you on? Every path that I could possibly <laughs> take. Every so let's opportunity. Look at one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, journalism. Uh, for example, I, I became a sales account executive for KOM in 1978 because I needed to buy furniture for a brand new house. And I had just had a baby, and I was planning to stay home for three years and then send that kid to school. And my former husband said, you know, I could pay for the mortgage on the house, but if you want furniture, you're going to have to work. And I went, what? (laughs) What is this? No. But I had to, so I went down. My cousin Janice said, you know, there's a position for account executive at KOM. And this was when we were in ORDOT. She said, why don't you go and apply? She said, you got such a gift of gab. This is, this is natural for you. I said, Janice, I've never sold anything in my life. She said, go. I drove down. I met Herb Rawson, who was the sales manager, and he hired me on the spot. So that started my exposure to media. Well, that's amazing. It, I thought it was, too. <laughs> I went home and thought, now what am I going to do? <laughs> I had to learn about sales, so I studied. 
my biggest advantage is that I'm not afraid to read. I love to read. So I went to the university and I bought marketing books and uh, uh, account uh, sales books. And then every time I went to the States, I would go to Berkeley, I would go to Stanford, I would go to San Fran, uh, and I would buy, I go to the bookstores and buy books and learned how to do marketing by myself. And then I, I made money. I broke house accounts and I, I convinced uh, management that I could not only protect what you're making in a house account, I could actually increase it, and then you can afford to pay me commission. And I broke my commission in three weeks, in three months, and I made a ton of money in sales, broadcast sales. I loved it because it wasn't tangible, and you have to work with the brain of somebody else. You got to convince somebody to do it. Right? Yeah, that was the best. That was the challenge for me. I could sell a car, hands down, because you're already there to buy one. But if I have to convince you to sell advertising, which you cannot prove sells anything, that to me is a challenge, and that's what, thri- what I thrive on. Wow. And then how did, that, how did you start f- getting folded into journalism from there? Oh, because immediately they wanted me to write my own commercials, and that started me on the writing path, and then they wanted me to uh, cover news, but I, couldn't, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to go report, so I stayed out of the newsroom, and then I became sales manager and pre-sold K57 one month, no, not one month, three months before they had the license, and so we had all the advertising before the license was even there, and I did that for a while, and then I started Images Advertising Agency, had a run-in with John Anderson, uh, and I said, you know, I'm done here. And, and so I moved. We started Images Advertising with Bobby Young Girl. And then I didn't want to expand the advertising agency t- to the point where it was going to get out of control. We would have to invest a lot of money in, in computer and, and art kind of software, and I, I wasn't going to do that. So I maxed out on that and said, hey, let's sell everything and open a children's boutique. So we went Monday's child, because I was born on a Monday. So I'm very partial to Monday, beginning of the week. And uh, we did that for a while, and I got tired of the retail. I didn't like waiting for people to come in the door. It wasn't active and action enough. So I sold, we closed it down, and I just went home and had babies. And then after that, I went and told John Anderson one day, I want my own show. And he goes, what? I mean, I just called him up. I I don't know who was on the radio, but I said, that guy doesn't know anything about the people of Guam. And I'm tired of listening to people from outside telling us about who we are and the way we should think. And he goes, okay, can you come in at 11 o'clock on Thursday? And I said, sure. When that hour was done, Lacey, the phones couldn't stop ringing. And the news department said, who is that? Go get her. So John said... He came out to the stairwell, and we were going down with the family, and he said, you want to come back tomorrow, 11 o'clock? I said, sure. And after that week, I was there every single day for the next 10 years. And then they expanded it. I mean, it just, so every opportunity comes up, and then the investigative reporting, and then I was managing editor for the Guam Variety. So that's when the hard news came in. It was when I started being managing editor and investigative reporting, and wow, did I like that. I loved investigating reporting. I wish I could do that today. Because I, I think everyone needs to be held accountable. And that's what's missing in media. Right. I think that's been your bottom line for a lot of the things that you've done. Yeah, but I'm not afraid of management either. I'm not afraid of challenging them. And, and, I, I, and, I, and it's because I know what my rights are as a journalist. And, you know, I'm not afraid if they're going to fire me. Go ahead, fire me. I don't care. I'm not going to work for you if you're not willing to do your job as a media entity. And we need very strong reporters on Guam. We need to ask the tough questions. We need to put our elected officials on the spot, women or not. You know, I'm not going to be partial to you because you're a woman. I'm going to be even harder on you because you're a woman. You think you, this is a role you take on on your own? <clears throat> nobody, nobody convinced you. You convinced yourself that this is what you want to do for us. So, yeah, we should all hold them accountable. And in, I'm sure you're going to be touching on that in your future episodes. I am. Do you see... Now, I mean, we're running into a lot of things when it comes to the media being barred or or things either being spun, you know, towards our, you know, trying to feed us a narrative or or us not having access to information. Well, I don't know why you don't have access, but I'll tell you the, the credibility issue 
uh, is a major concern for me. I've invited Lee Weber to be a speaker on the, at the Mark uh, seminar series. I think he's coming in in November. Well, this is one of the many things that you do, by the way. We'll touch on that. <laughs> too. <laughs> yeah, I'm chair for the Mark seminar series mm-hmm. as a research associate. But I, I want someone who's been in the institution long that can that can talk to me about the history of media on Guam. And, and you know, Lee was a publisher and I even ran into things with the PDN. Sure. Um and but I spoke up about it and so he understands and so the role of the media today we're the fourth estate. You know we are the fourth estate and, and our job is to bring light to the people about what's going on with our elected officials. Our job is not to PR our elected officials. Right. I have a real problem when journalism blends with public relations in public officials' lives. I'm not saying that that reporters can't go there because many reporters have crossed the line from being a reporter into working for public officials. But don't come back because that's where credibility is eroded. When they come back into the media and all of a sudden their hat switches. Why do you think now that I'm going to have any faith in your writing or in your reporting when you used to speak for a public official? Mm -hmm. I really have an issue with that. And, you know, I'll say that with Joan, she's here at KOM. She's probably one of the few people that I still respect from that standpoint because she's so capable of doing other things and I don't think she's I don't think she sold herself when she when she supported Rodriguez. And I, I actually interviewed him. And I when I interviewed Dennis, you know, they asked me if I would interview him and I said only on one condition. You are not going to ask me to ask you questions. I'm not there to make you look good. I said, you expect me to interview you? I'm going to go straight for your throat. Because you are asking me to bring out your personality, your attributes, and all your weaknesses to the people. And I said, but if you give me a set of questions and expect me to ask it, get somebody else. And so they agreed to the terms. I used my own equipment. And we did it at their house, and I did all the editing. I gave them the raw material, but they had to run. They couldn't edit anything from that. And so, yeah, I mean, that's the only way I think that your credibility can stand. And I think that that says something about them where they're not afraid to be, not be challenged. But this is truthful. They're not afraid this to is, be telling the truth. Right. And that's, that's what we owe <coughs> our listeners, Lacey, in the media. We need to be truthful. This is not... This is power that we have. The media has power. Um, One of the things I spoke about in my last column was for 25 years, I have struggled with management allowing me to use tomorrow words and, and, and spellings in my column. It's my column, you know, and so that's what you're paying me for to speak my mind and, and to, and to write things that from my perspective. And if you're going to edit that as you would a regular reporter, then that's not my column. So I woke up every Monday morning or every Sunday morning to see what they changed. And we're going to publish everything that should have been in there. <laughs> and congratulations on your long run yes. as a columnist. You time, just ended time it. Time to move on. Oh, I'm going to miss that, though. Oh, thank you. Uh, there are so many other projects you're working on, though, so I can't say that I'll miss you because I'm going to see you more often. You will truly. see me more often. And actually, I think I'm going to fold everything back into the podcast. I'm very excited about this because I've... When I got sick in February, as you know, I was sick the whole month with that virus. And it gave me a lot of time to meditate on where I was, what I wanted to do, and what future there was in mass communication. And, you know, I just text Marie one afternoon. I said, you still interested in me doing that, whatever it is? (laughs) And she said, yes. And so I said, okay, I'm ready. I think that you have a voice, of course, you, you because you've studied about Guam history and you help us document that, not just studying, but from your work with World War II 
uh, on your World War II projects to all your ancient Chamorro history, unearthing a lot of new things. How many times have I watched your series? And I'm like, oh, this is this is something new. And I pride myself on Aww. someone who, who like kind of reads up on stuff. But time yes. after time, there was something, a new development or a different perspective that we need to understand. So I, I also want to talk about your um, what you do with the Mark and the presidential, the, not the pres- presidential series, the Mark series, the mm-hmm. Mark seminar series. It's been something that I struggle with because I cannot make it yeah. often. And and are you, is this something that's going to? You told me last year you're going to continue this. Uh, well, I, I initially decided to stop because mm-hmm. I have so many opportunities. Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of work in the CNMI uh, from here on with, <coughs> with oral history, and so I kept thinking, wow, you know, I've got to take things off my plate because my fiesta plate is like really stacked and I don't want diabetes <laughs> you know I, in other words I don't want to be ineffective to the point that I'm doing so much that I can't get anything done right and so I, I was going through the okay what can what can I give up and writing the column was the very top of what I could give up not that I didn't want to do it anymore I I had a really good I had a good editor at at uh, the post um, Gainer worked was very easy to work with but it's just another deadline and that's what kills me it's like I live on deadlines and the deadlines were killing me um, and because I was so fluid in what I was doing on a regular basis every Friday which was deadline I thought oh my goodness what am I going to I have to sit and, and the writing it's not that hard but it got to the point where I wanted to go and see Jason I wanted to talk to Laser. I want to sit down and interview them and that's three or four hours and what was the compromise it was submitting a column that I didn't really think through or whatever and then they would get their hair up and and it's like you know you're you're supposed to and you, you know how that goes so you do shoddy job and I I respect them enough that I couldn't continue to do that I didn't do it much but you know they they're grammar police and it's like I don't want to write a grammatical column just because it's grammar and that's part of editing is that you need when you're writing a column I want you to feel like I'm talking to you and it's it doesn't always have to be so grammatically correct. That's not what makes a column. Right? Column writing is supposed to be different from edit from editorial, editorial right? Writing. Yeah, absolutely. But mm-hmm. I understand as well because even at the PDN, you know, I mean, Kent Douglas. Oh my goodness, it's like go and teach a UOG. If you want to do that, you want to hammer someone on grammar, go teach a UOG. Don't. And then they say, well, where's your verb? And I go, go buy one. <laughs> you know what a verb is? You know, you read the sentence. You literally are emailing me back for one word? Get real. <laughs> I, I, I really struggled with that. And I finally, you know, I, we finally work things out. We always do. But I think just this, my stamina is is what makes it happen. So that was one thing you ch- you cut out of your fiesta. Period. I cut out the column and I know I'm going to regret that, but it's time for other people to to write. And then the other thing that that I that I wanted to focus on and I said was my publications. I have 13 stories that I want to publish on the Gabret series and then now I'm doing the Wildlife of the Marianas and I have really good co-authors. And this is material that is long lasting. You know, you can, I know for one that, that Christine Scott Smith, who was the librarian at the, at the public library, she called me up one day and she said, do you know that you are the leading request for columns? I said, really? She goes, yeah, we got kids are coming in here asking, uh, where's that Steffi column? Because I wrote something that, that spurred somebody, right? Or that, that raised their air or whatever. And this happened with my son-in-law, Paul. I wrote one day that that Microsoft was better than Apple, and this is before, because I was using Microsoft computers, PCs, and he called me up, and he talked, and he goes, you know that, and he went on, and I, I said, where is your office, Paul? And this is, I didn't know who he was. He told me where I was, and I showed up and knocked on his door, and he was surprised. And that, for me, is what I do with somebody who disagrees with me. I want to know, what is it that I said or why? You know, change my my opinion. I'm not afraid of the differences. I'm, it's a learning experience all the time. So when I disagree with you, I'm not going to hide from you. I want to know, what is it? What? Wh- tell me why you disagree. 
And now we can continue to disagree, but I'll respect you for that. And so those are the kind of relationships that I've built, you know, over the years. So it's not easy to do what we do in media, but somebody's got to do it. And I'm glad it's us. <laughs> So you were talking about your books, and, and I don't want to. Oh wait, to let me not let me acknowledge. let me finish this, the seminar series because you asked oh, about yes, that, right? Oh yes, please. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the reason you are actually the reason, one of the reasons why we decide, I decided to put those videos on YouTube, because many people like you cannot go up to the university and cannot make those six thirty hours. It's not just media deadline; they have family. They have kids, young kids that are going. And so to be able to go to, to, to YouTube and watch it or watch it over and capture something that they miss is, is very frequent, actually. And it even got to the point where even if there's nobody who shows up, and we've only had it occur once, we need better support. We, we really want people to come. It's just so much fun when you're, you're doing a presentation and there's an audience there. You've had some really exciting people though on your show of not just excited but to hear the study that they've been doing yes. the studies they've been doing and hear it from them rather than it being compacted into like a small article exactly. so that's what i need that's also why i need the longer format with you yeah and and so we're we will continue to do that because i i decided that that's what i was going to cut off and then all the other research associates said don't you dare that, that's how we get our food too you know i mean it's an opportunity because not everyone can make it even though we should be there to support all the lectures not we are all very busy people and so that's when i said okay fine i'll continue to do it so yeah you can guarantee it's going to be on youtube so this is a monthly is still going to be monthly second tuesday of every month unless for some reason there's a conflict at the university and the lecture hall is not available then we move it to the third tuesday and it is monthly and when we can't find it where do we where can we go on youtube uh it's i believe it's you know what that's a good question. I think you can type in Mark Lecture, Mark Seminar Series, and then the host of of uh, lectures come out. It it drops down in, into. I've never gone. You know, I don't. I don't watch my own stuff. I I, I don't look back very very often because I'm so focused on moving Your forward. Your body of work is enormous. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, if I if I leave it in the dust, then then it's there for everyone else. But. I just I do, once I'm done I feel that I do the, I've never gone back to re-edit anything because when I edit it I want to do the best job then I don't take any shortcuts I hate shortcuts I've even destroyed entire videos and started all over again because I didn't like it and that's the kind of work I think I owe you right? yeah I think so too <laughs> so I don't I don't look back I it's there. It's there for you to view, and if you appreciate it, great. But I don't sit. Th- I don't like looking at myself. I don't like hearing myself. And what? And before we move on to that next topic, because I because I think this is such an important series. Can you tell everyone what what the Mark series does for the community and why this is important? Okay, thank you for that. Marks the Mark seminar series was started to promote Micronesian studies. And Micronesian studies is actually a you could get a master's in Micronesian studies at the University of Guam. Um, it's it's about Micronesian centric topics, and in the first year that I chaired it, that's what I went for topics that are of Micronesian concerns, and there's still many many more that are. In this second year, I focused a little bit more on the topics or the subjects that you can get a degree at the university, not just in Micronesian studies, because honestly, I get very few Micronesian studies interest in the series to present. I mean, I, I don't know why, but it's very difficult to get anybody in Micronesian studies to agree to present. So it forced me to keep it within the realm of UOG, but in other topics, biology or archaeology or you know business or whatever, and media. You can get a degree in media. So that's what we're going to be focusing. So this year we have a really good lineup. Um, BJ Cruz is going to come up, talk about being an OPA, being a senator, being a judge <laughs> and all that. And he, he gets so tired of doing that, but he's now, he's now gone the circle and he sees how that practical uh, application of those different roles really matter to how the operation of the government is done. Lee, like I said, is coming up to talk about you know the the 
how the condition of the media, not the history, but the condition of the media. Where really are we as media people? And what condition? Are we robust? Are we lax? You know, are we just an afterthought? And, and for me, whenever we... Credibility is paramount in media. If you don't have credibility, you're not going to get... People aren't going to respect you. Right. That, that is our bread and butter, truly. It should be... Our only currency, I, I believe, is yeah. it's credibility. It's our constitution. <clears throat> you need to be respected. Otherwise, your voice is nothing. You have no voice. And um, only... It's your work. It's your... It's your performance. So that's why I said to you earlier, I mean, you know, I, I would never tell someone in media, no, you can't go be a, a official spokesman for the governor or, the, or, or a congressman or whatever, but move on. Right. Don't come back. Because it, that's what erodes the credibility. Now, sometimes they can't, but again, that's your personal choice, right? Should have stayed. <laughs> okay, so we have about 10 minutes more. So. Okay. Of course, it's your next projects. Uh, on top of our April 1st, um, your April 1st, that's when you're going to record Launch. your first. What, what's what's going to be called? Arlene Live on podcast. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so when I was a kid, like in high school, okay, I'm... Have you been listening to me that long? Yes. Are you kidding me? <clears throat> I don't know why. I was just kind of an odd kid where I, I listened to talk radio when I was... Maybe because my grandfather uh, had it on all the time. But, of course, you were the woman. Yes. The lo- like almost the lone woman on, on the radio. At the time, I, I, I think Mona Roberts was there before me, but Mona didn't... Her do- topic was, was different, yeah, though. it was. Um, I'm probably the only talk show host, male and female, to have kicked John Anderson off primetime one hour. And that was, I hesitated on that, but that's how effective the show was, that they asked him, John, we need to move you to eight. And he was so crushed. (laughs) And, you know, I have to give John Anderson credit Mm -hmm. for my development in media, because every time he needed something done, he'd say, Ark, can you do this? And I'd say, I'll try. And I... I spent a lot of my career years trying to satisfy him and Al Linton. And uh, that's how I became an investigative reporter. I mean, they had a whole newsroom of people, but they said, nope. So what what are you going to be talking about on Arlene Live? Everything and anything. It'll be a surprise. <laughs> I guess we're just going to have to listen in. You're going to have to. On the yeah. KOM. Um, yes, and that's, that's, a, that's a good part is that I get to be part of that um, offering, right? You're there too, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's important to, for you to know that you have been in this, this business for all these years. And it's not like you're a not just a veteran, but you have great val- Obviously, you have great value. We're trying to fold you into this new generation of listeners. And, and uh, you know, I was uh, in invited to be a guest with um, um, hmm, Ma- Master Random. It's another uh, podcast. Right. He's my nephew. Hey. He, he, yeah. And when I went, I, I went up and I said, what are you to Tony Atta? Because I saw the campaign. Mm-hmm. He said, oh, that's my dad. I said, dude, you're my nephew. And it, I was amazed that, you know, because his, his uh, listenership is, is also uh, a different group that, that I was used to. But my interview with him was pretty popular. It, it had a high rating, and I thought, hmm. So that was my only experience with podcasting. So I'm, I'm really excited to be part of the menu here at KOM. So before we go, tell us a little bit about the, these projects that you're going to be going. You're, I mean, you've axed one of your, your big things that we've had for years, writing your columns to have your your publications. You've spoken to us before about this particular book. Can you show uh, Jason's Manning the Camera? Here. Okay, let me hold it up for Jason. This is my my first book in a series of Icarera and Cultura and Gabret. Mm-hmm. Now, what that is is these are these are cultural uh, stories that Gabriel will be experiencing uh, as a main character through a series of thirteen of these books. And so, my grandchildren would be characters in the book, and also my first cousins. I thought that this was this is a great project because we're starting to see more and more children's books and and what is your ultimate goal with this project? Well, I'm not big on I'm still hooked on truth. <laughs> 
I'm hooked on things that things that we lived, right. experiences we have done. I'm not good on fiction. I don't have that kind of brain that that can just go to outer space and talk about aliens and I, I and fairies and things like that. That's not that's not my reality. Uh, I'm very grounded. So I think that there's value in the way we used to do things as family. Jason's father was a good friend of mine, John. And I interviewed his family about the Hodnu, and they were included in my DVD series because his grandfather was a, had, had used that Hodnu to cook for the family. And so I'm still, I want to take those kind of cultural stories that mean something and that real life people in our, in our history actually did and then fold in that creative angle of how Gabriel experiences it from my point of view. And this is, um, obviously this is a children's book, but yes. for people like me too, who I'm, I'm still learning or trying to learn tomorrow, this is an important resource for me. Well, thank you, but it's also an important resource for people like Kin. Right? Oh. Yeah, because if Kin reads the story, (coughs) he can also attach a memory to this story, even though he has his own story. So the idea is these books are supposed to spur other people's memories about activities that they did. So the second book that's coming out is titled Mama Latsada, The Act of Sucking on Raw Eggs. And that was something that my uncle used to introduce to girls who were entering puberty to prime their bodies for motherhood before we had (laughs) vitamins. And it was, a, to me, a really gross thing. And I told my father, I'm not going to have any kids, so I don't need that. (laughs) But my cousins to this day still continue this practice. I, I just... So I write this story. Gabriel's in the story. My cousin Karen is in the story. My cousin Janice is in the story. And my granddaughter Madison, the oldest of my grandchildren, plays me in the book. It's almost like you're, you are documenting a part of history, but just in a different format. In a different format. And then um, before we go, just real, real quickly, yes. because this is one of the things that have truly excited me. One of the projects that you did, no one else, no one, I mean, you just do so many things. But sometimes I get these videos from your pictures of these birds that I have never, ever imagined that we have it's here, here on island. It's here. So this project here that you're doing, or, yeah. or kind of one of your... I can't call it a hobby. Some people would call it a hobby. Is it a hobby? It's a hobby. It really is, but I have to do it every day. If I don't get my (laughs) fix, when I start feeling pressure, you know, just from work, I'll go, Bob, I'm going birding. And he goes, okay. And I'm everywhere. I just get in the car and I'll look for birds. And I took Hope Cristobal out with me recently. It was hilarious. I go, Hope, there's a bird. She goes, where? What are you looking at? And I would literally take a picture of the bird and I'd show her in the camera. And she goes, hey. And, and it just sounds like uh, like such an obscure hobby, but it's not, be- especially because of the birds, our type of birds that we have here, what birds, little birds we have. So it's super amazing and fascinating. And I think hopefully we're going to hear more about it in your podcast. You will hear part and a lot other, of it there. other things we do here at KOM. Yeah. Maybe go along with you one day. That would be we, fun. Oh, that would be wonderful. Mm-hmm. You're welcome to come along. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. And we'll see you. My pleasure. Soon on Arlene Live. See you on the podcast. (laughs) Thanks. Good night. Bye.